Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung, Earthlitz, and welcome to another episode of the 2000 AD Thrillcast. Now, you may well have picked up one of his Rebus novels. Crime writer Ian Rankin is also a huge comic book fan and a 2000 AD fan as well, having grown up reading that alongside Battle and Action and Victor and uh, Bino and Dandy. So I had the absolute pleasure to chat to him for just over an hour about uh, his love of the medium, uh, the influence that uh, 2000 AD and other comics has had on the way that he writes and how uh, the decline of the traditional comic book industry he feels may well have uh, contributed to a decline in literacy which is uh, a fascinating perspective so as well as enjoying the medium he's also a big advocate for it even turned his hand to writing comic books with uh, a hellblazer graphic novel he did something for uh, Clint and uh, has also got a revelation about a little something that he's working on at the moment which is very fascinating to hear so, sit back, relax, and enjoy a little chat with Ian Rankin. But uh, but thanks for agreeing to take a bit of time to to chat. I really appreciate it. No problem. Are you are you still reading 2000 AD, or is this something that you used to do before? Yeah, I mean, I read it occasionally. No, mm. not uh, not religiously the way I used to. Sure. Uh, I mean, up until my kind of late twenties, it was you know it was a uh, well, no, actually, you know what happened? I mean, I'd, I read it right up until I left London to go to France, and then I couldn't get it anymore. <laughs> so up until I was 30, up until I was 30, and then I had sort of a you know six-year gap. Right. Um, so, but I still buy it occasionally. I still like the best of, you know, when you get the kind of retro ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, what, around about when did you, did you go to France? What sort of year was that? Uh, well, we... Um, let me think. Got married in eighty six. Uh, moved to London. Then left London in nineteen ninety. So I was thirty years old, um, and moved uh, lock, stock, and barrel with my wife and cat to rural France uh, in the pre-internet age. <laughs> so we sort of lost touch with a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, wow. <laughs> the, the the world back then was a very different place, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, although, to, to be honest with you, I discovered the wonders of French comics, which were, um, and French comics were a lot uh, ruder than <laughs> you were going to find in the UK. <laughs> well, I mean, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, actually, because um, there's, there's a lot of talk at the moment about why French comics are in so much more robust health than British comics and, and you know, the influence of, of, of American things like that. It, with the, with the Bay Day, with the, with, with the Bandeau Um mm. what was the kind of thing you were picking up? Because it's very, it's very genre-fied, isn't it? They, they've got their crime comics and their sci-fi comics and everything. Well, you had, I mean, you went to the supermarket and you had a big selection of Bond Dessiné in hardcover. Mm. Um, and lots of kids and, and sort of men my age all standing around reading them, not actually buying them, but just reading them there. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you had everything from Lucky Luke, yeah. which would appeal to the, to the small kids, through some really dark stuff. There was some really dark sort of futuristic stuff and crime. Um, and, you know, no holds barred in terms of its depiction of sex and violence. And all on display in the supermarket and the newsagent and, uh, yeah, and also, but, you know, so there was a, some, there was stuff for every age group, I would say, and for every taste. But on top of that was also the the the, the you know the the, the cultural um, thing that nobody looked down on you for reading comics. A bit mm. like in Japan, you know, it was like that Japanese thing where comics were an accepted part of literacy, whether you were young or old. And you had you had people who grew up in the sixties, and you know, were reading all the kind of sci-fi from then. Um, and you had people who were kind of just teenagers at the time when I moved there, and they had their own sort of things that they enjoyed. And, you know, there was just, I don't know, I just, I, I, I liked the culture, and I liked the fact that, you know, the kind of mag, a lot of the magazines you bought would have a bit of politics, quite a lot of satire, uh, and some really good quality um, cartoon strips in there as well. Mm. I always find it fascinating that uh, 
most people in uh, Britain's exposure to French comics is, e- is either through the, the very few translations that you get, or it's through heavy metal, through, through uh, yeah. uh, uh, Metal Holland. And, and yeah. that's, the, that's the kind of really adult stuff. That's the, the kind of, you know, boobs out. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The very lush artwork, and it, it, but that's such a, as you say, that's such a small part of. But I mean, that wasn't that wasn't nearly as adult as something like, is it Manara? Mm, of course. Um, yeah, which was um, you're going, geez, I can't believe there isn't an X certificate slapped on this. <laughs> and I mean, that was just sitting there in a the supermarket for you to have a little peruse as you went as you were buying your yogurt and your baguette, <laughs> you know. And and here's um, you know wide open beavers inside, as uh, Kurt Vonnegut would say. Um, it was an extraordinary. Experience experience and uh, uh, I, you know so that, yeah so that, I mean that kept me going for a few years mm. um, but when I, I mean I started reading comics when I was well I mean like you know three four five six yeah. um, and it was it was everything it was mostly most of the stuff from the DC Thompson stable so it was the kind of Beano and the Dandy and then you segued from that to the kind of boys own adventure stuff the Victor and the Hotspur and the Lion and the Tiger mm. Um, and those then took me to things like 2080. I mean, to some of the TV tie-ins, so your Doctor Who comics and your Jerry Anderson comics, TV 21, stuff like that. Um, there was one, I think, called Countdown that lasted for a mm, while. Yeah. Was, it was mostly kind of strips from TV. Yeah. Um, and, and then, you know, eventually, I mean, when 2080 started, I was an early adopter, as we say in the trade. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting that, that, that at the time, Scotland had such a rich uh, industry because I mean DC Thompson was practically yeah. like a national publisher, you know. Absolutely, and uh, you know, I'll, and a lot of that rubbed off because a lot of the guys who had either worked in that um, worked for that company early on, or who had certainly grown up reading those comics, went on to, to you know to work in 2000 AD and mm. to become um, artists and writers themselves. And I mean, still, I think Scotland punches well above its way when it comes to comic books. I mean, you know, Mark Miller is is kind of generating an industry from his front room in Glasgow. <laughs> well, a, 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 and a 2000 AD alumni himself. Absolutely, absolutely. You've got people like Grant Morrison, of course. Um, and, 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 you know, before that, you had the old guard. The old guard at 2000 AD were, you know, it was kind of, it was, it was mostly run by, by, by Scots who... Could use any number of pseudonyms and punt at six stories a week. <laughs> well, there's Much that, that Protestant work ethic. I don't know what it is. <laughs> there's, there's that the wonderful thing about the, uh, the the history of sheds in the history of 2000 AD. <laughs> the the um, it was, uh, Pat Mills had one, and uh, and Alan Grant had one, and it, it it seemed to be the perfect environment for coming up with all these stories. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, people like Cam Kennedy doing the art as well. I mean, mm. there was these. I mean, these are. You know, I mean, it was it, it was just a lovely thing to behold, and and you know because they got their their names on the on the stories. Uh, I mean, sometimes pseudonymously, but you know, often using their real names. Mm. You know, you you sort of you got to know that they were kind of you were idolising these people before you ever knew who the hell they were. Yeah, and you know, people. I mean, I mean, and it was the art. I mean, the art was eye popping. I mean, you know, the kind of amount of detail that you get in a, a nemesis, the warlock story. You could, or you know, you could just slain or whatever. You could stare at those pictures for hours, mm. and it would just take you to this other universe, um, which, of course, is what the best artwork should do anyway. What do you think are the elements that mean that Scotland, uh, Scotland's creative community, has had such an influence on? I mean, I, I, I mean, I think, yeah, you know, I think it's partly that thing that we're talking about is mm. that from. From the get go, there were, you know, it's a literacy thing. I mean, when I was growing up, I mean, I was working class, grew up in a coal mining village. Nobody around me read books. My parents weren't great readers, mm. but I was just obsessed with comics, and comics were cheap, affordable literacy. And I had an uncle who worked in the newspaper industry and on a local paper, and he said to my parents, "It doesn't matter what Ian's reading as long as he's reading." <laughs> Absolutely. And so, and so my kind of mania, I was getting like 10, 12 comics a week. Mm. And, you know, there were, there were pocket money prices. You could afford it. And my parents just, you know, they just, they, they, they went along with it. You know, it was keeping me out of trouble. Um, and it was, and it was, it was, you know, pushing my imagination in all kinds of directions. So mm. I'd be sitting there in my bedroom. I mean, the first things I ever tried to write were comics. Yeah. I would get bits, I'd get bits of paper and fold, you know, bits of blank paper and fold them in half and make little four page booklets and break them up into squares and have little stick people having adventures. 
Um, and I would make a little free gift, like a badge. Um, you know, I would cut a piece of cardboard, stick a safety pin in the back of sellotape and put it on the front going, free gift this week. <laughs> I mean, I was doing all of that from my kind of pre-teen bedroom. Yeah. Um, I, I just was no good at drawing. I couldn't. I couldn't draw. You know, so it was it was quite frustrating for me. The, all these stories that I was inventing, um, I couldn't do anything with them. Mm. But it, but it was you know. But it was part of that. That you know, the thing about writers. I mean, I've been a writer now. You know, more than way more than half my life. I've been a published novelist. But I'm still the same kid mm. who's who sat in his bedroom, creating adventures, universes, and make believe friends. Uh, in his imagination and then transferring that to paper. Lots of kids invent worlds. Lots of kids, um, you know, like making up stories, but only a small proportion of those will go on to be writers uh, in, in, in their world. What, what, what do you think is the, 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 the quality, the element that means that they continue with that imaginative process? Um, well... I don't know. I mean, the adult world says at some point you've got to put away childish things. Mm. And for whatever reason, writers go, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to put away childish <laughs> things. I'm going to continue uh, to have childish things. Mm. And it could just be that we are, um, you know, we, we've got arrested development, that we, we just, you know, never fell into that, what I would think of as a trap mm. of saying you leave school you get a degree or some kind of certificate or a piece of paper and you go and get a job until you retire. Um, some of us go, uh, I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm. You know? And I mean, for a, for a while before my books were successful, I mean, I had to work, I had to have jobs and I had a series of jobs, but to me, they were only a means of making some money to give me the free time so that I could sit and write. Yeah. So, so the writing was always paramount to me. Um, whether it was trying to do comics or whether it was writing lyrics for non-existent groups or whether it was writing poetry because I couldn't speak to girls, I was too shy, so I would go <laughs> home and write poems about them instead. You know, whatever it had to be, it was yeah. a way of exploring the world. It was a way of making sense of the world. And it was a way of playing God. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a very therapeutic thing to write all this stuff down. I mean, even today, if I walk out my front door and someone nearly runs me over, I can come back inside and kill them on paper. <laughs> you know? And that is incredibly cathartic. Yeah. It's incredibly therapeutic. Uh, and I'm sure that being a writer has saved me a fortune in um, uh, therapist's fees. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's come back to those those mini mini comics that you were doing. It's it, uh, um, it's something that Al Ewing, one of our uh, one of our writers, uh, has, has always said because he 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 used to do for conventions. He used to do exactly that. He'd make these tiny little mini comics with um, uh, you know his. He, he, I'm sure he he'll forgive me for saying his artistic uh, abilities aren't that well developed. Um, <laughs> But that was all, always his tip. If you want to start making comics, then actually start off with a, with, with a mini comic. Was that, in hindsight, was that a way of your brain breaking down how to tell stories, or was it just learning how to do it through through mimicry of what you were reading? Yeah, well, I, I you know I think it was it was all I knew. I mean, in the early days, the only narrative I really knew was comic book narrative. Mm. And so, and, and I was an obsessive kid. It wasn't enough for me just to read these things. I also wanted to create them. And that was true when I started listening to music. When I started listening to pop music, it wasn't enough just to listen. I wanted to be in a band. Um, when I started to read books, novels, I thought, okay, I want to try and write one of these now. You know, um, it just was part of that thing of, of I don't know, wanting the, the uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, it wasn't enough just to be on the periphery. It wasn't enough for it to be a passive experience. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of the process. And, you know, I mean, all kids live in this fantasy world where they've, they've got role playing games and adventure stories that are happening inside their heads all the time and imaginary friends and playing with toys and you name it. Um, and then it all gets pushed to one side and they're, they're told they can't do it anymore. And I just, you know, I, it was so much fun. Why the hell would I do that? It was just so much fun. <laughs> And I had, to, I had a terrible decision at the age of 17 because, you know, I'd, none of my family had been to uni and I was clever enough to get to go. Mm. And it, I was intended to become an accountant because I had one uncle who was an accountant and he owned his own house and he owned his own car. Right. And my parents had neither of those. They rented the house all their days and never, never had a car. So, I said, okay, I'll be an accountant. I'll make some money. That's the way to make money is be an accountant. And then at 17, I had this epiphany. Um, that was, why am I doing that? 
Why am I going to go to university to study a subject I'm not really interested in just to get a job? And I had to tell my parents, look, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do English literature. And they were kind of horrified <laughs> and, and said, what, what kind of job will you get with that? And I went, mm. well, I'll come back here and be a teacher. I'll be an English teacher. Mm. And that's kind of what I thought. That was what I thought my life would be. And that would always keep me close to writing. It would almost always keep me close to books and storytelling. And it would mean that I could maybe do some writing along the way. Based on based on your age, you seem to have been in the the, the, the perfect uh, generation to have benefited from the gradual change and maturing of storytelling in comic books. Because you say when 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 you were first reading them when you were a child, it was all very much you know uh, the Beano and Dandy. They're moving on to the boys' own adventure. But then as you're a teenager, you're starting to get um, battle and action and things like that. Were you were you reading these titles? Was this was this a change that you were aware of at the time? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, mm. battling that. I mean, it was it was a little bit more hardcore. It was a little bit harder edged. Um, we were starting to get away from the sort of you know the, the comics of kind of rules and under eight laws for under eighteen and everything. Yeah. And suddenly the the, the the kind of creators were saying, well, let's just push us a little bit further. Let's just push the the graphic the depiction of violence a little bit further. Let's um, let's do mature stories. Let's do stories with big themes. I mean, yeah. uh, there was an extraordinary change for me. Um, when I started to do things like read Alan Moore's Swamp Thing mm. in my early 20s, Swamp Thing and then eventually Watchmen um, and Dark Knight, of course, um, Frank Miller's Dark Knight. And you're suddenly going, whoa, this is proper grown up. And these are, these are, this is literature, mm. is, is, a, is what it was. It was literature. Um, big story arcs, serious moral themes, um, you know, convoluted timelines. These were, this wasn't, you know, uh, bully beef beating people up. This this wasn't Ur Willie with his with his friends having adventures on go karts. <laughs> this was this was you know these were stories for grown ups um, created by people who were very serious about their art form and mm -hmm. didn't think of it as an art form and thought of it as a very grown up adult serious way of of telling a story. And I just was absolutely blown away by. It. I mean, I was so blown away by by Watchmen that my uh, one two three my third published novel. I called it Watchman, singular, um, and it was it was a spy novel set in London, but it was a little nod to Alan Moore hmm. because I was learning a lot about about um, the structure of storytelling and taking risks with stories, and I was learning all of that from people like Alan Moore. That's fascinating because you know reading interviews with Alan and 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 seeing his work over over, over the decades, he learned so much from the comics he was reading when he was younger. Um, uh, he then takes those lessons and begins to apply them and, and change them and subvert them. Um, I wonder if there's something quite, I don't know, is, is there something quite pure about the storytelling in comics that is right there in front of you? You can't disguise it with flowery language. You have to be quite uh, economical, particularly in British comics where you've only got a set number of pages to uh, uh, to play yeah. with. Do, 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 do you think that, that kind of, I don't know, focuses the mind a little bit? I mean, it's, it's, I'm not really answering your question, but it's sure. something that, that was, I think, very important to my generation as well and possibly it affected Alan was punk. Mm. Punk came up, we'd have this very flowery, progressive rock music where it was all, you know, it was all synthesizers and organs and capes. <laughs> and and you had to have gone to the right schools and the right colleges and you had to be able to afford the right instruments and everything. Mm. You had to be classically trained as a musician, all that stuff. I would have that. And then suddenly punk came along and blew that out of the water. And I was 17 in 1977, the perfect age for punk. And mm. what punk said as an aesthetic, as a philosophy, was just go out and give it a go. Yeah, you don't you don't need to know people in the industry. You don't need to go have gone to the right schools. You don't need to be able to afford all the right gear. Just try it, give it a go. And we had a school. We started a school magazine. You know, I did join a punk band for a short time as the vocalist. I was writing the lyrics. We went into the studio. We had no idea what we were doing, but we weren't going to let anybody tell us we couldn't do it. Yeah. And and that was very important, you know. Coming from my background, it's kind of working class. Didn't know anybody who was who was a writer. Didn't know anybody who who who, who wrote novels or who was a poet. Um, suddenly arrived at Edinburgh University in 1978. The, the band at Freshers Week were the were the Ramones. They wow. played at Freshers Week, and you and you know Peru Boer playing and stuff, and all this music, you know, because punk very quickly became something more 
complex and, and richer, actually, the kind of new wave stuff that came after them, mm. the quite dark, gothic stuff that came afterwards, the Cure and people like that, took, took you to another place as well. But, you know, crucially, you know, nobody was asking you what school you went to. If you if you had any interest in, in doing this stuff, do it. Mm. And that was huge. And I mean, I think that did channel into the, 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 the British comic scene as well. That, you know, it was a lot of kind of people who were kind of self-taught and yeah. just weren't going to weren't going to take no for an answer. Well, I mean, that's, that, that there was a, a real kind of DIY ethos with punk. I mean, and you and you you see it in uh, you know the zines and things like that that that, that started yeah, popping, yeah, yeah. that started popping up. And it, it, it's I think it's notable how uh, many of the journalists and writers that I uh, know and respect cut their teeth on that kind of well, you know, we like this thing, so we're just going to make it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, at, you know, you know. At high school, we started a magazine called Mainlines, which was mostly reviews of Clash albums and reviews of pubs that would let you in, even though if you weren't eighteen. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, as soon as I got to university, it was, there was friends of mine started a poetry magazine, and various poetry magazines came and went. Bands were emerging every five or ten minutes, and you could leap in and join a band for ten minutes, and then. Mm. They didn't want you anymore. The band split up and then you went on to another band. <laughs> and it was just an extraordinary kind of melting pot of ideas. And, you know, people were trying to make movies. People were trying to script movies. People wanted to be performance artists. People, you know, people wanted to be actors. It was just all this this melange of, of people giving stuff a go. And, of course, 99% of it was either no good or they lost interest after a while. Mm. Um, but as a, as, a, as a means of getting started, it was fantastic because you were meeting like-minded people um, who were just game for anything. And we all read 2000 AD. We all read 2000 AD. I mean, it was mm. one of the kind of things that, you know, it was, it was almost like w walking in school in the 70s with your Rick Wakeman album and you would suddenly <laughs> find out who your friends were. <laughs> you know, you'd be, you'd be sitting in the student union with a, with a copy of 2000 AD yeah. uh, and people would be going, oh, yeah, you know, do, I, I love, you know, I like Alan Moore. Do you like Nemesis? Yeah, I love Nemesis. What about, you know, you like Rogue? Yeah, I'm not skin on Rogue Trooper. What about Judge Dredd? Yeah, but it does show a kind of dystopian society. I don't know whether I like him or not because he's not the kind of, you know, you, <laughs> just all that kind of conversation um, and, and all the humour that was in it as well. I remember sitting in my student flat that I shared with a few friends from high school hmm. and we were sitting talking about Row Jaws and Hammerstein from 2008 and we suddenly looked at each other and went, Rogers and Hammerstein. We just we suddenly got it. We hadn't got it until then. <laughs> it was a, that it was the most obvious pun in the world. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised whenever we did because we on the Facebook page for 2008. We, we we do like a daily classic cover, and uh, whenever it's it's Rogers and and and, and Hammerstein, uh, there's always somebody in the comments who says, oh, "I just got that," and they, they're, they're like in their in their fifties. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the humor was wonderful. It was yeah. very, it was very subversive humor. I mean, Ace Trucking Company. Um, there was just such subversive humor in it, and and you know, it was it was taken. Um, you know, things like things you could identify with, like Star Wars. I mean, Ace Trucking Company was obviously like take on Star Wars to a certain extent, and and just you know, tongue in cheek, having a, having a laugh at it. Uh, but in a kind of slight, I mean, in a slight a reverential way, it should be satirical and reverential at the same time. Hmm. I think my favourite short form one was an Alan Moore one when he did DR and Quench. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when 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 you got when you, when you opened up two thousand AD and after a gap in months, suddenly there was a DR and Quench story. I just punched the air because <laughs> I knew that I was going to be laughing for the next hour or two. Yeah. Was was there something appealing about that because it's that kind of teenage rebellion kind of you know yeah, th th that, that punkish attitude brought out in 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 the strip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, you know, you, you, I mean, you didn't have to have a, an A level in literature to know that um, <laughs> that, that well, Sam Slade was pro possibly a take on the American Private Eye. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so you, you were getting the references. I mean, Judge Dredd was just full of. You know, the, here's the Hunter Vassar block. Yeah. And you go, hang on a minute, isn't he an artist? Um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, all the kind of fun they were having um, with kind of stereotypes and archetypes and with cultural references just enriched the experience and made you feel kind of, it made you feel kind of slightly clever for getting the references. Even if it took us months to get Rojo's and Hammerstein. <laughs> when we got it, we were just so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you kind of, um, you, you say you stopped reading in, in sort of about 1990. Um, you you basically covered the pretty much the original golden age and sort of the next generation, so all, all the way through oh, Prog yeah. Five Hundred kind of thing. 
Yeah, I mean, when I when I moved to London in eighty, well, I, I tell you what, my my wedding day, my wife still laughs at this when she's not furious about it. But on my <laughs> wedding day, when it, when she was off getting her hair done and everything with her mum, yeah. I was down to use agents getting two thousand AD. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, we were getting married at eleven. That gave me a couple of hours to get my two thousand AD and get it read. Uh, so I, you know, the first thing I did, that she said, "What do you do? Like, what do you do?" The first thing you did this when you woke up this morning, I went, "Well, I've got two thousand AD and read it." You know, I just yeah. <laughs> so, and my boxes of comics, you know, followed me everywhere. When when we eventually moved to France, the boxes of comics came with me. Um, but when we moved to London, we were living in Tottenham, and there was a, a nice wee comic shop that I found uh, at Seven Sisters. I mean, obviously no longer around, hmm. but the guy who ran that, and I can't remember his name, but he was fantastic. I mean, he was a guy who said to me. You know, oh, you like Alan Moore? He started the Swamp Thing. So from like what Swamp Thing twenty one or whatever it was when Alan Moore took it over, I was getting Swamp Thing, and of course Swamp Thing then leads you into John Constantine, hmm. um, and he and you know, and it, I got turned on to so you know so much of the stuff that the British writers who'd cut their teeth on pla- in places like two thousand AD had suddenly gone to the states, uh, and had exploded. Um, and it was just the most, ex- that was a really exciting time, those early years living in London and, and going for my fix of comics and, you know, all the original Watchmen, um, and all the John, all the Hellblazers from issue one. Uh, and it's just, you know, some of them were misfires, but the vast majority of them were just phenomenal. Um, there were kind of people at the top of their game mm. who, who'd grown in confidence, who'd been nurtured and who suddenly went, right, time to roll the sleeves up and, and show the world what we've got. I mean, the first comic shop I went into would have been in Edinburgh. There was definitely a comic shop in Edinburgh when I arrived in 78. Um, I hadn't come across the phenomenon before. And then when we moved to London, yeah, the first thing I wanted to do was find a comic shop. Yeah. Um, but the, when, I was, when I was very young, uh, the, the local um, grocer shop around the corner from my house, the comics were strung from a clothes line <laughs> held together with clothes pegs. And they were so high off the ground, you literally couldn't get them. Really? And you, had to point, you had to point to them. Because I was tiny, you know, I was like <laughs> seven or eight. You had to point to them and, then, and the grocer would come and lift it down and give it to you. And they would kind of, they were kind of sparse. So you would maybe get Superman something or other and there'd be a continuing story, but another three issues before you got the next one. Mm. And, and so the kind of, the continuing story thing just passed me by. I was much more interested in the adverts for X-ray specs and, <laughs> uh, you know, submarines, a fully functioning submarine that would take one person. You're going, what? <laughs> or a Jeep that you could drive actually with an engine. I'm going, wait, I'd want to go to America. I need to live in America. This is insane. <laughs> you know, we, we, the toys we had just seemed so kind of poor in comparison. And things like, you know, um, record clubs and book clubs, you know, you get three LPs for a dollar. You're going, oh, my God. You can only dream of that stuff. But, yeah, I mean, the community thing was important. And, and people saying, oh, have you tried? I mean, it was the same with music, you know. Mm. Oh, have a listen to this. You know, I mean, I got into jazz because my best friend who I respected was started listening to jazz. And I thought, okay, well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Um, <laughs> I got into Frank Zappa because my mate's big brother said, if you don't like Frank Zappa, I'm going to punch you in the face. I mean, it was that kind of thing, <laughs> you know. So so you did it, you know. But, I mean, I'm sitting here. I've, got, I've actually got a few comics in front of me because I was over in Glasgow on Monday mm. and I just happened to go into two comic shops, uh, A1 and Forbidden Planet. Um, picked up the latest issues of, you know, Killer Be Killed and Black Monday Murders. Um, there aren't that many that I collect on a, on a regular basis, mm. but there are a few that I just, you know, I, I'm lazy now. I'm kind of going, you know what? Yeah, I like it. I'll wait until it's bundled. Yeah. And I'll just buy the, I'll just buy the graphic, I'll be the big chunky graphic novel. Um, cause it's cheaper. Uh, and just and just because you know it, it saves me the hassle of kind of trying to get into a comic shop and you you get number ten but you don't get number eleven you go oh bloody hell yeah you know and you've got to try and you've got to scrub I mean these uh, these days you can do it on the internet but I hate doing it on the internet so I mean I've got I've got Killer B Kill I mean Brew Baker there are certain people like Brew Baker and Sean Phillips mm. I mean everything they do I want I've because it's a trademark of quality you know yeah and then there's other stuff I mean a mate of mine who works in a comic shop in Edinburgh said have you heard of this Black Monday Murders I went no. Mm. He said, it, honestly, it's right up your street. It's so dark. It's so twisted. The artwork's so amazing. And the mythos, the mythology behind it, you're just going to love it. He said, it's a bit like, uh, it's a bit like Alan Moore. There's a whole mythology behind it. Yeah. Um, and so he kept me number one. And yeah, so now I've just got number six. Because mm. that, um, that's the, the, the series about uh, uh, banking cartels being yeah, banking big cartels houses of magic kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like the, 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 the you know, the, uh, the banking crash of the 30s was kind of put together by these people and they still control the world through money and through these 
secret organisations and they're all kind of aliens and all the rest of it and it's a cop on their tail but it's just it's just an, it's an amazing story it's really beautifully done mm-hmm. there's, I mean there's some people like uh, I mean Gail Simone whatever she does I'll always buy it because I think I'm going to enjoy it because I've enjoyed everything she's done mm-hmm. there are certain people um, where you you know you just think yeah and there's friends of mine like uh, Lauren Bukas who's a South African writer. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we've we've uh, had her on the podcast before. In crime. Oh, yeah. there you go. Well, I mean, Lauren did a uh, she did a Survivors Club, hmm. and I thought, well, I like her stuff. I'm going to like her comic. Hmm. I'm, I've, I've got to give it a go. You know, I can't remember how I came out across Gail Simone stuff. I think somebody just said to me, "You're going to love this." And I think you know, it wasn't Clean Room. It was before Clean Room. But but you know, when she brought out Clean Room, I thought from number one, I'm going to love this to bits. Hmm. Um, and it's it's great when that happens, and you never lose that childlike excitement. You know, I mean, going into the, I mean, coming back from Glasgow with two or three comics and just sitting down and straight away reading them, such a wonderful thing. And yeah. then you go, no, oh, I've got to wait now for the next one. <laughs> got to wait for the next one. Oh no, you know, it's a kind of frustrating. In this day and age when we're used to getting everything, I mean, you you, you like a TV show now. Whoosh! You can download the whole series, mm, mm. and you can binge watch it straight away. The culture now is let's just dump everything there for you from the word go. And with comics, we've not quite got there yet. And sometimes they go, yeah, well, they're a bit late. I mean, that um, Black uh, Monday Murders, mm. there was like a big gap between four and five. I think it's because they said, well, the guy's just he's struggling to catch up. He's just struggling to get it done. And you go, Christ. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, <laughs> that, you know, that, that isn't just on tap. It isn't there. It isn't immediate. Yeah, and you've got to you've got to wait, and you've got to hunt, and you've you've got to have that hunger. You've got to have that hunger and that passion, and and I love that to bits. And it's something that other cultures are losing a bit. I mean, you know, I write novels, and I bring a novel out every year or two, and then something the novel's published, and a big fan tweets me and says, "Read it, loved it. When's the next one?" And you go, "Hang on a minute, mate. It was published yesterday." <laughs> And they go, yeah, yeah, I couldn't sleep. I just stood up all night and read it. I go, for fuck's sake, that took me a year to write. And you've read it in a night. Go back and read it again. Read it, <laughs> read it properly this time. Read it properly this time. There's nuances you're missing. There's themes you're missing. There's in-jokes you're missing. Come yeah, on, give yeah. it a go. Don't just, you know, read it in a splurge like that. And I mean, that's great. It's great. You know, it's lovely that people just, you know, can't put your books down. But at the same time, um, you know, you, you, that thing where, yeah, I've read that, and when's the next one? Mm. You know, it, take, it takes quite a long time to produce. It takes a long time to produce. I'm working on a comic just now with, with Sean Phillips. It's probably top secret. Uh, <laughs> but it's just, it's just a one-off. It's just a six-page thing that's going to be in a collection. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm working on that, and I'm going, you know, but, I mean, Sean's such a busy guy. I mean, when's he going to find the time to do these six pages? You know, it's like, it's like 25, 30 drawings. Yeah. But, you know, I, I mean, I can write it quickly, but it's going to take him a while to draw it. Writing it's quick. Getting the ideas is slow. Writing it's quick. I found that when I did, um, what's it called? Um, uh, Dark Entries. You know, oh, the, the one, Hellblazer one, off, one yeah. Um, Hellblazer, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was lovely, you know, to have a vertical comics email you and say, Ian, we think you're a comics book fan. Would you like to write for us? <laughs> and you go, what the fuck took you so long? What took you so long? I've been waiting 40 years. Um, and then they say, you know, do you want to come up with your own ideas? Do you want to use one of our characters? And I, I gave them a range of stuff. I did some original stuff. Um, I pitched some ideas at them, and I pitched a couple of ideas. And they went for the Hellblazer because I said, look, you know, I like the character. He's like a, he's like a human. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's not Superman. He's human. He's fallible. He's got flaws. Mm. He's got he's got the private eye thing going on. Is that can he, you know, you can have a little nod to the to the classic private eye story. But he's dealing with the supernatural, um, and so you can stretch yourself a little bit. The stuff I can't do in the Rebus books. Rebus Inspector Rebus can't suddenly be fighting demons. <laughs> I think I think that would be an incredible Elseworld series. Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? It'd be <laughs> yeah. a, a great uh, stepping out of that alternate, stepping out of alternate reality where Rebus and, and John Constantine are, are battling crime together. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, but you can't do it. But this was it was just a lovely chance to do something with a character. But then, of course, you've got the oh my god. People are going to hate it. Hmm. There will be Hellblazer fans who don't like this because it's not quite the cosmology that they know. We're kind of slightly stepping out of the Hellblazer cosmology. And of course, you know, fans are very passionate people. Hmm. And when you start messing with their character, they don't like it. Because was that the first time you'd, you'd written something where there was an established fandom beforehand? Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's the only time I've done it. I mean, right. you know, the comic I'm doing with Sean is is my own stuff. Mm. I did a I did a one off for Clint. Do you remember Mark Miller's Clint? Yeah, for a yeah. while. Yeah, I mean, I did a one off for him. I can't remember if it was a two page or a four page or 
but I just kind of duck, you know, I basically dipped a toe in the water. Um, the, the, you know, suddenly doing a 100, 200 page standalone graphic novel, wow, you're going, and with no training, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, I'll tell you what training I had. The training I had was I had the special edition of Watchmen, the collected edition, and at the back were some pages of Alan Moore's script. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, I've got to put all that detail in? Okay. And of course, since then, I've met lots of comic book writers and artists, and they go, no, come on, man, you don't have to do, you know, he's an idiot. He said he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a one-off, he's a genius, and he's insane. You know, nobody does as much detail as Alan Moore does. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, so, oh, right, because the first page of the Constantine, I just, it was like a whole page mm. of information for the artist. Uh, and then the editor very quickly, uh, Will um, at Vertigo, said, "Look, you know, you don't need to do that, Ian." <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, we've 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 talked about it on the podcast before, where um, you you have uh, the comic script writing spectrum, where you have Alan Moore at one end and you have John Wagner at the other, where one there you, put, go. you know one of them um, will write a page and the other one will write a word. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, part of that is trust in your artist. And yeah. when I did the, uh, I mean. Um, uh, Del Adrea, who was who I was working with. I mean, I, we had no we had no contact. We had no one on one contact. Mm. I mean, he was in where Italy, Spain. I forget. I was in Edinburgh. The editor was in New York. Everything went to New York, and then went to him, and then back to New York. So you know, I mean, from I haven't spoken to a lot of people like Sean Phillips and um, and uh, 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 oh god, I'm forgetting his name. Now, the losers. Uh, oh, Andy did. Writer. Andy, yeah. Andy, and, and and Jock, who he worked with on the Losers, which I loved to bits as well. Um, you know, and they'll say, well, you know, if you can get a work, if you get to know the artist, if you know, so that you know, then they said it's a very different experience. It's a much more enriching experience because mm. um, you can you can give and receive feedback. I was kind of doing it in a bit of a vacuum, sitting here doing it in Edinburgh, and certainly now that I know Sean Phillips, you know, that I'm just about to send him the, the script. And and I know you know I know that he'll have good ideas. I know that I'll get I'll get feedback. Mm. Um, and and he knows that I'll accept the feedback because we've we've met in social social situations. So you know he knows there's not going to be a big clash of egos here. Yeah. That, you know that I will I, that I will take um, his comments on board. So we'll wait and see. Maybe he'll say it's absolute genius. Let's just go on with it and do it. <laughs> Fine. There's also that element that that when you're a novel writer, you're doing that on your own. You know that there'll be an editing process with your with your yeah. editor. But when you're in comics, you're working with when you're writing comics, yeah, you're working yeah, with an yeah. artist and an editor, and you know there might be a colorist and a letterer and all these people yeah, down, horrible. down the road. Horrible. Yeah, yeah, it's horrible. Horrible. So you, horrible. you, you no, I mean, the thing about being a the thing about being a novelist is you are God. <laughs> you have the com- you have complete control. I mean, until you decide to show your stuff to someone else, yeah, like an editor, a publisher. Um, it's you know you, nobody's giving you feedback, nobody's mm. giving you anything. You're just doing it all, and it's exactly the way you think it needs to be, and exact, and it's absolutely perfect. Yeah. And then you go and show it to somebody, and they go, "Well, I don't understand why he does that." And you go, oh, "No, come on." <laughs> um, uh, and you realise you've not written the perfect novel, yeah. but until you, it's like Schrodinger's cat. Until you show it to somebody, you have written the perfect novel yeah. every time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I show it to, I show my novels to my wife first. And mm. she gives me feedback. So by the time it goes to the publisher, I always reckon it's had one edit. Right. Um, so when the editor says, "Look, Ian, can you think about changing a few things?" I go, "Well, let me just stop you there. <laughs> this has already been this has already been edited." <laughs> and uh, and so then we have a little bit of a fight. Um, <laughs> but you know, these days they don't. I mean, the publishers don't really ask me to make huge, big structural changes. Mm. Um, and I don't work well collegiately. I mean, I've tried writing screenplays with you know co screenwriters, and I just don't get it. I just don't. I can't play the games that have to be played when you're working as part of a team. So, um, so yeah, so the, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm probably not, I think what I'm saying in a shorthand way is I'm not, I'm not, I'm not psychologically up for becoming a comic book writer. <laughs> I, I'm getting that feeling, certainly. It was yeah. just, you, you used the phrase you'd used earlier uh, when you were talking about when, when, when you were a kid and doing your own comics, that you you get to be God. So uh, that, that yeah. seems to be the thing that you've uh, you've stuck to. I, I'm, I mean, is, there, is that partly the reason why you went to do novels? Because you, you, you published from, from a relatively early age rather than going into comics, which you clearly have uh, or had and have a passion for well yeah i mean i had no idea how to get into the comics industry mm. um uh, i you know i mean 2000 ad or i mean none of the comics that I, I read had anything that said hey if you've got an idea get in touch yeah um and you know i mean 
as a as a as a, a kind of young Tyro writer at uni, I did start meeting other writers. I met poets and I met people who were in publishing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you would say, well, how? And you'd meet other novelists, and they would, and you'd say to them, so who's your agent, and how did you get published? And but I never ever ever met comics people. Mm. I didn't. They, I, I didn't. I, I wasn't at art school. I wasn't at art college, and so I wasn't hanging around with graphic artists and. Um, so that, I mean, the people I knew read comics, but none of us knew anybody who made comics. Yeah, and this was in the days before comics conventions. Mm. So it wasn't as if you could even, on a yearly basis, go along. It was a bit like the music scene. You know, a band would come to Edinburgh. This band like Yes or Jethro Tull, and they would be very distant from the fans. Mm. There would be no meet and greet. You wouldn't be seeing them in the local pub. They would come into town, do the gig, go away again. They were distant beasts. And comics was a bit like that. I mean, I loved the comics, but who were these people who made them and how did you get into the industry? I had literally no idea. And because I couldn't draw, I mean, I thought that put me at a disadvantage. Well, the first thing I would need to do is find an artist and Mm. we'd have to do something together and then we'd have to try and find somebody who was interested in it. So it just seemed like a much easier thing to write a novel and, and, you know, post it, put it in a jiffy bag and send it to a publishing house. Because when you bought a novel, in the front was the address of the publisher. Right, right, of course. So you thought, you, yeah, so you thought well, I, I like Martin Amos. He's published by Cape. Mm. Here's the address in Bedford Row in London. I'll send my novel to Jonathan Cape. Boom. They didn't publish me. They turned me down. But, you know. <laughs> <I was laughs> the first Rebus novel was turned down by the first five London publishers it was sent to. Wow. I've got the rejection letters on show at the moment at a museum in Edinburgh, um, <laughs> which I think is a great lesson for young writers, for wannabe writers, is to go, what, even Re- 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 Rebus? Well, surely that was successful early on. Nope. Mm. First, I was only sent to six publishers, and the first five turned it down. And also, I've got the first contract there, which shows that I, I got paid £1,500 for my first novel, first Rebus novel. Um, which I believe is still the going rate for a first novel. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No comment. Um, yeah, really. It, it, it's that's something that you find when 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 people submit um, uh, future shocks because uh, we still have open submissions at 2000 AD a couple of times a year, and mm. um, you know you, you, uh, you see on social media people who mm-hmm. who submit and submit and submit and submit and and you know they're getting the rejection letters, but the ones you 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 are fairly sure you know, have a good chance of the ones who go, I got a rejection letter, but I'm going to send more next time. There's a, a, yeah. a, a great element of perseverance required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just being being stubborn, being yeah. stubborn. I mean, just being, you know, having a belief in yourself, thinking, well, you know, you might not like that, but you might like the next thing I write. It's mm. not going to stop me writing. I mean, some people don't handle rejection well, but, uh, uh, you know, I think it's part, of, it's part of the process you've got to go through. You've got to survive that. You've got to survive people... And then you look at your thing and go, well, what, why didn't they like it? What was it about it they didn't like? What could I do better next time? And sometimes you'll get a little bit of feedback, but even if you don't get any feedback, you'll go, well, you know, did I send it to the wrong person? Or could mm-hmm. I just have tightened up a little bit? Or could I have done that differently? Um, what, you know, are they, the, are they the kind of person who's looking for this kind of material or should I be looking elsewhere? And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a steep learning curve. Um, and sometimes it will take you a long time to get noticed and a long time to get published, and even then a long time to get successful. Mm. Um, I mean, I was in my 40s before I was making serious money, having first been pu- first published my first novel at 25. Um, and you just, you know, it, you've got to want to do it, and you've got to want, you've got to love doing it, even when you're not getting anywhere with it. Did, did, and that was it for me, that writing was always a hobby. It was from yeah. the get-go, it was something that I enjoyed doing. It was something I did before it became a career. There's a, a big thing. I mean, uh, uh, we're recording this the, the, the a couple of days before Thought Bubble in Leeds, which has a, a, a huge element of self-publishing of of people who are doing it themselves. Um, and certainly in comics, it, it feels very much as if uh, that there is a, a kind of like a parallel industry where people are uh, have that kind of almost punk DIY spirit. You know, they're going, well, yeah. you know, I, I, I want to do my own thing and I'm going to get it done. Um, of course, novels have kind of been through that as well with the big self-publishing yeah, yeah. Uh, for, yeah. for, for phenomenon. Um, do you think that is something that is profound change or do you think that was always there just bubbling mm-hmm. away under the surface? We just know about it now because of the internet. Yeah, I mean, it's to do with, I mean, you know, there's there's a hunger for narrative. <laughs> human beings human beings love stories. They love mm. narrative. 
the means of production might change, the means of dissemination might change, but that hunger, I think, will always be there. I mean, computer games wouldn't exist without narrative. Everybody likes a narrative. Um, kids are texting on their phones or using narrative. And, yeah, I mean, the, can he, this punk ethos, it seems to have come back again. You know, the, the internet and, and computers have made it easier than ever to get your stuff out there. Um uh, online and the same goes for publishing people are now starting to bypass traditional publishing they just take the stuff straight to amazon as a, as a file mm. and just dump it and amazon sell it. and if anybody buys it then that's fine if nobody buys it it just stays there yeah. um but it's you know it's a it's a hard job because you spend all your time marketing yourself and trying to get people to notice you're out there because yeah. there are millions of other people out there at the same time what i like when i go into comic shops now is there tends to be this local talent there'll be a little thing near the till mm. and it'll be local talent and it'll be kind of just people doing their own thing as you say it'll be little folded up stapled booklets of black and white inked drawings um i remember a wonderful thing called uh, film filmology uh which was a thing a guy did in, uh, 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 and, and, uh, you know, I went to my local indie cinema. Mm. I've got my local indie cinema and there would be this thing called something like filmology. And it was just a guy who did this little cartoon thing. And there were like 32 page little booklets. And it would be about a different thing about filmmaking and film and what you should see when you go to a film and how do you do it? You know, how's film made and how do people watch and what tricks do directors play and everything else? And it was absolutely brilliant. He eventually did get it um, bundled into a proper graphic novel. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting his name. It's, I'm hopeless. Absolutely. I think I've got Alzheimer's. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, I'd go along to the cinema. Oh, here's a little comic book that will tell me more about what, how to enjoy cinema in a, in a different way or how to enjoy it in a deeper way. Mm. That was absolutely brilliant. Lovely. And he just did it himself. He did it himself. And I was very taken by that. And I still am. Um, and whenever anybody does something local in inverted commas, you know, somebody says, oh, this is a Scottish comic. You go, oh, great. So it's based in Glasgow or something, whether it's the bogeyman back in the day yeah. um, or whether it's Red Thorn now, you know, I'll go, right, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Mm. Um, and I'll go, oh, my God, look, that's Glasgow. There's that, you know, the drones of Glasgow or drones of Edinburgh. You go, oh, wow. I remember when Batman came to Edinburgh. I was, I was absolutely over the moon. <laughs> I you know, remember Batman that so at Edinburgh well. Castle. <laughs> yeah. Batman at Edinburgh Castle. You go, whoa. <laughs> You know, I just, I just blew me away. I, I, and, I just, um, I just loved the conceit of uh, what was it, the McWaynes? Yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, Bruce. I mean, Bruce does come from Robert the Bruce. We've been told that. Well, there we go. The Bruce and Bruce Wayne comes yeah. from Robert the Bruce, apparently. Um, I mean, the, I love the Bogeyman as well. The Bogeyman, which was you know a guy who's in an insane asylum, insane asylum but thinks he's uh, Humphrey Bogart in yeah. a detective story, and just comes out and everything that happens to him, he thinks is part of like an, a, a, a private eye film. <laughs> just hilarious, absolutely hilarious. Uh, I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, you know, come on. There's nothing better than comics. I mean, there's, there's absolutely nothing better than losing yourself in that world that encompasses everything from childhood to adulthood. Mm. You know, it's it. You know, when you read them as an adult, it takes you back to being a kid, and when you read them as a kid, it makes you feel more grown up. I mean, what's better than that? <laughs> one, one thing I wanted to <clears throat> touch on is 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 to try and find uh, uh, comics's influence on the way that you write, not just in terms of, of the things that you write about, because there's very clearly a uh, a, 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 a streak of noir through you mm. a mile wide, but also in the way that you tell stories. Um, do, do, do you see an influence there? Well, yeah, I mean, people have, I mean, I don't know, but people have said, readers have said right from the get-go that I write in a very visual fashion. Right. Um, that it feels very filmic. So that, I, you know, that, and, and I think I set the scene, the, the kind of, the location, I do it with kind of, you know, just a few dabs, a few brush strokes. Mm. Um, and you can do a lot in a very short uh, space of time. And I'm sure all of that I've learned from comics. Well, comics and film, I guess, but a lot of it from comics. I remember somebody coming up to me and saying, oh, I didn't like that scene in the mortuary. And I went, go back and look at it again. It was one sentence about the smell. Yeah. And one sentence about the smell told you everything. You, your, no, it just fired your imagination and your imagination did the rest. And an early editor, as a, as a novelist, one of my early editors said to me, trust the reader. Hmm. The reader's imagination will be much more graphic than anything you can throw in the page. And so it's, so it's all about what you leave out. It's all about what you leave out. And I think when I started doing comics to start with, I was just, I was ba so bad at it because I would go, I would have, you know, frame one, a hand pushing open a door, frame two, walking into the room, frame, frame three, he's reached the bar, yeah. frame four, the barman saying, what do you want to drink? You're going, that's four frames. <laughs> You don't need that. You know, you don't yeah. need, I mean, just, you did, and you did, so it's kind of a self editing process um, of what don't you need? What don't you need and what doesn't the reader need? 
what will the reader be able to do without you laying it on a plate for them? And that's something that comics, because, I mean, you said it right from the get-go, that comics only have a limited amount of space um, to get across the story they want to tell, a limited number of pages to get across the story they want to tell, um, and a limited palette of colours and everything else. Um uh, with a novel, it can get very loose and baggy because with a novel, especially with a computer, you can just keep writing, keep writing, make a novel 600 pages, 700 mm. pages, 800 pages, keep going. Um, and and it's problematic, I think, because the best crime fiction tends to be, they're kind of short, short, sharp books. And I like short, sharp. I mean, I don't always write them, but I like <laughs> to read short, sharp books. And I think, my, no, but honestly, I'm looking at the shelf here and my books got really, really fat up until Rebus novel number... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Hmm. Ten dead souls was the longest. And they started to get skinny again. And the latest one is the skinniest one in a while. And I think I'm coming back to that that brevity and trusting the reader um, and and letting the reader do a lot of the work. One of the things that, that you've uh, already mentioned, uh, particularly about 2000 AD, is uh, the dark humour, the the, the 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 kind of themes that it was dealing with, but in a uh, quite often a humorous way. Um, how much do you think uh, comics like that, uh, like 2000 AD, like Battle in Action, have have established uh, your kind of moral centre? Because a, a, a lot of the time, uh, looking back, I find people. Um, I don't. It's an influence on the way that they view right and wrong, the way they view their own cynicism, the way that they mature mm. as human beings. How much of a, an influence has, has things like 2000 AD had on you as as essentially a human being? Well, well I mean, there was a lot of there was a lot of um, satire in 2000 AD, mm. which became more obvious to me as I, as I got older. I mean, it maybe wasn't so obvious to me when I was 15 or 16, but by the time I was in my 20s, it definitely was. There was a critique of society, it was a critique of, of, of capitalism, it was a critique of the modern way of life. And, uh, and, and I enjoyed that. And that kind of, I think it's about questioning, questioning, um, officialdom, questioning the politicians, questioning the bureaucracy, questioning the way the world is and why is it this way? I mean, all of that I get from, uh, those comics. And I think a whole generation of satirists in the UK got it as well. Mm. So a lot of the satire that eventually ended up on our screens, whether it was the young ones, Rick Mail and all that lot, or whether it was um, Chris Morris, um, I'm sure if you went back and talked to these people, they would all have been readers of comics and influenced by comics. Um, you know, because the comics books did get quite dark. They did get quite dystopian. And, you know, Superman wasn't going to save the world. Mm. The world was going to hell. And we, we'd made the mess. We were in the mess and we were going to have to sort the mess. And you got, you know, there was, there were the comics I always liked were the ones that didn't have the superheroes. Yeah. They just had fairly ordinary people. I mean, you know, Judge Dredd and all the people around them. Well, okay. Not the dark judges. But you know what I mean? <laughs> most of the, most of the Judge Dredd stories are human beings who are screwing up for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and being found out and being judged and doing the judging. Mm. Um, something like uh, when I got to, to um, uh, Hellblazer, you know, he was recognizably a pretty screwed up human being who was trying to, 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 to who was pushing against the chaos, who was mm. pushing against the mess that the world was in. Um, and, and I really, I got, you know, I got, a, I still get a lot of that. I mean, John Reba, I mean, John Rebus, it's like any, almost like a comic book name, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, there's no, there's never been anybody in the world, well, actually, I say there's never been anyone called Rebus. Rebus is actually a Polish surname I discovered. But a Rebus is a picture puzzle. That's why he's called Rebus, mm. which again makes him almost like Doctor Strange. I mean, it's almost like, you know, um, it's one of those names that, that you would get from a comic book character. Um, and John Rebus is a, he's, he's a maverick. He's, he's pushing against the, the powers that be. He operates almost like a private eye, more than a police detective. He's not happy in a team. He's happiest on his own. He's a bit of an anarchist. If you're rich and and posh and in a position of power and privilege and you commit a crime, he's going to come down on you. If you're poor and disenfranchised and you've you've stolen something because you need to put food on the table, he'll give you a break. Mm. So there's all of that, all of those kind of, you've just said it, moral lessons. I mean, moral lessons, I mean, I don't think comic books or any other cultural artifact needs to be moralistic. No. 
but they're written by people who have a code. They're written by people who live in a real world and who have ways of living in the real world, and they can't help but have some of their values drip into the stuff they make. Yeah. And so you're obviously going to get people's points of view, their perspectives, and their way of looking at the world and why they, what they think is going on and why they think it's going on and what we might be able to do about it to get us out of this mess. Yeah. And all of that is kind of wrapped up in everything I've done, um, and it's been wrapped up in everything I've read. Mm. It's, that, it's that classic uh, Pat Mills uh, way of writing comics, where, where, where you take morality or, or, or class structure or, or you know even just right and wrong, and you twist it, you subvert it to make it fresh again. It's the, the classic kind of satire. And what I've um, increasingly noticed um, as I've reread, uh, particularly Judge Dredd with uh, John Wagner's stuff, <coughs> is um, how subtle the morality of his writing is. So Things like, uh, and I'm going to be writing a feature about this soon. There's, there's a, um, there are robots all the way through Judge Dredd who are sarcastic and hard put upon. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they're, they're lawyers or they're taxi drivers or, um, e even sometimes it's, it's the voice of the lawmaster, um, that, that, that's very kind of stoic and, and a little bit sarcastic. And as you say, it drips with that kind of, awareness of uh, you know perspective on the world of uh yeah, yeah, morality and compass yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. i mean it, it yeah i mean it, it almost it almost um yeah it almost gives you a, 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 a view of what the future is going to be a future of kind of amazon drone yeah and and people being shunted aside by robots and um yeah and 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 robots taking us allowing um electronics and ai to take control of our everyday lives mm. So that, so that we do become more passive, you know, and, you know, I mean, when they have the kind of the, the, the big fat eating competitions in Judge Dredd, I mean, you can, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a nod to or the obesity crisis. Yeah. Um, you know, people are just getting wheeled about. They're too fat for anything. So they just get wheeled about and they just eat everything. Um, you go, hang on a minute. Is that supposed to be modern America? <laughs> uh, and, and by extension, everybody, I mean, by extension, uh, by extension, the West, and they're mm. kind of greed and what are, voracious appetite is going to do to us eventually um yeah i mean all of that all of that and and this can be very i mean the thing about judge dread is i mean it always fascinated me because i couldn't like the guy because he was a, he was he stood for officialdom and the state mm. and he was like a kind of he was like a, he was like kind of the, the hardest nut security guy you were ever going to come up against <laughs> <laughs> you know, at a time when, at a time when, you know, we were, we were, go and we students were going out and protesting against nuclear power and everything and coming up against these faceless cops, um, who would come out of kind of unmarked vans, um, with batons drawn. Mm. And then you had the minor string, you did exactly the same thing. It was suddenly us and them. The cops were tooled up to an extent you hadn't seen before in a way that you were seeing in Judge Dredd. Um, and and so I couldn't like Judge Dredd because he represented all of that. On the other hand, um, he was the good guy. Mm. He was he was trying. I mean, he was sort of trying to bring some kind of order to a world that was in a perilous state. And you know, it was either him or anarchy. Yeah. I mean, it was either him or it was or it was constant riots on the street. And you got that with block wars. You know, if you take away the judges from the equation, you've suddenly got you've suddenly got a, 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 a funny a very feral state um you know that isn't uh, that's very akin to something like lord of the flies well, and and so you you, you, know, you almost need you, i mean whether you like it or not you need something there to make you behave mm. well that, that's what's been so fascinating about what what john's done over the last sort of 15 years or so is <clears throat> slowly surely questioning that linchpin of the whole thing mm. um you know you, you get a story like origins where uh the, the 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 very crux of the story spoilers for anybody who's not mm. uh read it mm. um is that you know it, it gets to the end and the guy who set up the entire system says well it's not meant to be permanent but yeah. the whole point of justice department is that it is forever it, it is the you know it holds on with an iron uh, with an iron fist but um so it, it's it's Having gone for so long, it's now examining the very yeah. assumptions right at the beginning, which is an incredible achievement over over forty years. You know? Yeah, I know. For a comic, yeah. for a comic to do that yeah. is amazing. And I mean, yeah, and of course, it makes you think about juntas. You know, sort of where the generals come in and say, "Well, 
the political system isn't working, nobody's happy, everybody's rioting, so we better come in and just bring about some law and order. Mm. But we'll we'll leave. I mean, don't worry, we'll go back to just being <laughs> generals again as soon as everything's okay. And then they, they tend to get a taste of power and they stick around. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's something that we've seen in human existence for, for, for millennia, mm. is this notion that if you give people a taste of power, they want to keep it. Um, and, they, and they don't want to hand it back to the people, uh, perish the thought, the people are horrible. So they'll keep it for themselves. Um, yeah, no, I think I, I, I just, you know, I mean, that, I don't know. I almost wish that, I, you know, I, I almost wish I was a science fiction writer because I, I just think these are some of the cleverest people around because they do sit and think, where are we going next? Because mm. people say to me, when are you going to write your Brexit novel? And I go, I can't until it's happened. Yeah. I can't look into the future and say what Brexit is going to mean mm. until after it's happened. Once it's happened and the dust has settled, I can maybe do a crime novel that has Brexit as a theme. But I'm not a science fiction writer. I can't prognosticate. I can't look into the future. Mm. Um, and the best science fiction, whether it's novels, short stories, comics, has always um, been about looking at the way we're headed. And it's a kind of warning to us um, that if we keep headed the same way, we're in trouble. Mm. Why, just out of curiosity, why did you choose crime? Why, why Rebus? I don't think I did. I mean, I think uh, I, 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 I wanted to write about Edinburgh. I wanted to write about contemporary Scotland. I wanted mm. to write urban fiction. Um, and, I, and I wanted to write an updated version of Jekyll and Hyde. Right. So, I, I mean, Jekyll and Hyde was a novel that I am still obsessed with. Mm. I was obsessed with then. And to me, it was a novel about, I mean, it's not just about good and evil. It's, it was a novel about Edinburgh. It was a novel about the two sides of Edinburgh, the haves and the half nots the kind of rational, scientific, and the irrational and kind of chaotic, the mm. kind of the Jekyll and the Hyde, the, the new town, which is planned and rational, and the old town, which is chaotic. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Rebus in that first book, you're meant to think could be the killer. Mm. So we're, we're actually dealing like in a Jekyll and Hyde person. And I'd, I'd left all these red herrings around and stuff. I didn't read crime fiction at that time. Right. I, I didn't. I'd, and I thought, this is a one-off. I'm going to write about this guy, and I'll never write about him again. And, uh, and I, I mean, you know, I, I wrote a spy novel and I wrote a big sort of techno thriller. And then I came back to Rebus because I kind of got to like him as a character. Mm. And I thought, if I want to talk about society from top to bottom, if I want to write about social issues, if I want to write about politics, um, the crime novel is the perfect way to do it because the detective has access to every layer of society from the top to the bottom. Mm. So this one character can allow me to explore the world around me more fully than any other character that I can that I can invent. Um, so I haven't stuck around for two or three or four books. That was it. He just refused to leave. <laughs> I mean, he 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 joins. Uh, well, the detective joins kind of journalist and private investigator, and and you know a couple of other standard people for for exactly that reason, yeah. I guess that they yeah. they have access to the places that, or at least a, a reason to go into the places that normal people wouldn't Absolutely. necessarily go into. And, and you know, I mean, I was I was a fan of Private Eye films and things. I thought, mm. oh, maybe I could make him a Private Eye. No, because the Private Eye doesn't really exist. Yeah. in the UK culture. Mm. I mean, we, do, we just don't believe in them as characters in the same in, in the way that Americans believe in private eyes. So I thought, well, he's got to be a professional detective. I mean, journalists, yeah, and I've used journalists a lot in the, in the books, but people can, can you know, slam the door in the face of a journalist yeah. and refuse to talk to them, whereas a detective is going to be able to drill a little bit deeper um, and has a, a, an element of power at a disposal that a journalist wouldn't have. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, so Rebus kind of stuck around because he was useful. <laughs> um, one thing I want to talk about, I've, I've, I've read a couple of things online uh, where you've been quite passionate, and we've referred to this already uh, during this chat, about um, comics as uh, uh, aids to literacy. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you, 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 you mentioned... It might have been in, in one interview where where your son was struggling with Shakespeare and you gave him a graphic novel yeah. uh, with with, yeah. uh, with with manga. I gave him the manga uh, Shakespeare. There you yeah, go. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Perfect. Um, I mean, how it, it's it's interesting how over the last thirty or forty years we've seen a decline in the newsstand, uh, the comics newsstand. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, mm -hmm. when you were a kid and was, you know when mm -hmm. I was a kid as well, you'd still get that massive range of of comics and they wouldn't at all have a, a, a piece of plastic tat on the front of them um yeah, or be, or yeah, be tied yeah. into a tv show but 
it, uh, is there an anecdotal correlation between the decline in comics and the you know decline in standards of literacy? Is it, or is well, it? I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's anecdotal or not. I mean, I was on a literacy commission that was set up a few years ago in Scotland by the Labour Party, hmm. and we prepared a report to give to the to give to the Parliament. And one of the things that we discussed was was boys leaving primary school age 12, mm. going to high school and basically stopping reading, basically right. just stopping reading. And one thing that we had noted or we did know was, was you know, there weren't as many comics around as there used to be. And it was like one rung of the ladder had been taken away. Yeah one rung of the ladder to literacy had been taken away. Um, and the comics that were around, as you said, were, were kind of exploitative. They were just tied into a pop group or, or a TV show. Um, and they were much more expensive than they used to be. Um, and, and a lot of the stuff in them just wasn't storytelling. It wasn't proper narrative. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 did, we flagged that up, that we thought one of the things, if you wanted to get teenagers, especially teenage boys, to read, give them more comics, give them things they actually want to read. Um, and, that, I mean, that, you know, that story of my son was, was, was true, that he, he, I gave him Shakespeare as a comic book because, you know, I thought I, once he's read it, if he gets the story, he goes, oh, yeah, I love that. He might be going to actually read the, 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 the proper play. Mm. Um, because, you know, I mean, that was, uh, that was something that I, you know, I mean, the, comics took me to books. I mean, comic, reading comics took me to reading novels. It was just the next stage. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so it's, it is, I think it is an important part of... Uh, of people's growing up is, uh, and whether they're doing it online, I mean, whether they're reading them on their tablet or whether they're reading them as physical comics, um, I do think there's, there's, there's something there, uh, that's useful as an, as an aid to literacy and as a way of taking people to the next stage in their reading, um, career, which could be, you know, I don't know, full length books or short stories or plays, whatever it is, poetry. Mm -hmm. I mean, who the hell knows? Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, comics played a much more important part in that. And I think we, we appreciate, I mean, people like DC Thompson educated a generation of readers. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's notable. I think how, um, you had those two big British publishers. You had DC Thompson uh, up in Scotland, and you had IPC down in 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 London. Yeah, and their audiences probably accounted for most of the children in Britain at one time or another. So, yeah. you know, if 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 you knew a kid in sixties, seventies, or early eighties Britain, there's a very good chance they will have been reading a DC Thompson or an IPC uh, title. On a regular basis, so you know, and, and it's, it, it, it's it, and it's it's different now because reading comics, reading a story, reading a narrative is not necessarily the same thing as you know reading something on the internet, reading an article that you skim through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say actually, as a postscript to that story about my son, was that mm. he when when um, Dark Entries was published, he sat on the stairs of our house and he read it in about forty five minutes and said, "Dad, don't give up the day job." <laughs> So uh, that was a little <laughs> critique there from my son. Uh, <laughs> oh dear! Um, yeah, I know. What can you do? What can you do? What can you do? Um, have, you, have, you but, uh, have you introduced him to two thousand AD? Say again. Have you introduced him to two thousand AD? I've introduced him. Uh, yeah, two thousand AD and various other comics. Yeah. I mean, he's a huge fan of. of, of he, he loves. I mean, he loves Alan Moore. I, in fact, excitingly, he got to hang up with Alan Moore once. Alan Moore was up in Edinburgh doing the book festival yeah. and we happened to bump into him and he was going along to see Stuart Lee, the comedian, do a show and we were going, we had tickets for the show so we went along and sat there together and Jack was just, my son Jack was thrilled to hang out with Alan Moore. Um, that was that was a buzz. Um, he still, I mean, he does still occasionally read comics. He, when he was young, he loved a French, there was a French comic called Kid Paddle and Kid Paddle is a kid who gets into video games but he actually, he's in the game. So it's like arcade games. And he'd be playing the arcade games and something he's actually in the game doing stuff. And they were just kind of, they were those proper Bond Disney yeah. you know, like in hardback. Um, but there must have been about 15 or 20 of them. And I remember the time I used to go on tour to France or Belgium, I would try and find the latest one because they were in French, yeah. which was great for his language skills as well. <laughs> um, you know, because I mean, he would be able to work out what was going on. I mean, there, wasn't, there weren't many words in them. Mm. It was mostly action. 
Um, but you know, but it was it was helping his, his French. I mean, if I could have introduced him to Metal Lure Law, I would have done as well. <laughs> maybe not Manara though. Maybe well, no, ma- maybe maybe not for the best. Um, that sounds very similar to a series that was in Eagle in the nineteen eighties, which was uh, Computer Warrior, uh, which is about a kid who ends up in computer games, though quite often not of his own uh, own willing. Oh, Computer Warrior. Okay. All right. Well, this was. This wasn't quite the same because Kid Padlet was just his imagination. I mean, he was oh, only right, I see. his imagination. Kind of a little Nemo kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, aside from this thing you're doing with Sean, have you got any impulse to try again, do something a bit different? Right for 2000 yeah, yeah, AD, yeah. who I knows? Mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, when, if people get in touch, I mean, if, if publishers get in touch and say, do you fancy trying your hand at a comic? Um, it, you know, it makes me think about... The thing, about, the thing is, it's got to be... It's like when somebody comes and says, do you fancy writing a play or a radio play? You've got to say, well, the, the, the story has got to be, this has got to be the best way of telling that story. I can't just take an idea for a novel and think I'll do it as a graphic novel. It's got to be something that will only work or will best work with that visual element um, as well as the words. And, you know, I, usually when I get an idea for something, it feels like a novel. I go, oh, that feels like a novel. Um, it's not often I get an idea for something and say, oh, that's definitely a play or that's definitely a, a graphic novel. Um, but, you know, I like, I, I don't know. I mean, I would, love, I would love somebody else, not me, but somebody else to do a Rebus graphic novel. So any, 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 any budding um, graphic novel creators out there, um, you know, could, could sift through the Rebus stuff and find a story that would work as a graphic novel and do it. That'd be great. I'd be very happy. Is this something that you've, you've never been tempted to do yourself just for practice uh well no i mean maybe i just need a bit of, if i've got a bit of free time and i'm twiddling my thumbs maybe i'll think about it <laughs> i mean doing this one for sean i mean doing, doing this little this little one about world it's got a kind of world war one riff mm. um uh, you know i mean it just kind of it got me thinking about that way of of putting together a story and just thinking how exciting it is that you can sort of you know you can have a kind of foreground and it's something in the foreground but behind it is something that's more much more fantastical that's actually the inside of the character's head or something mm. um and you know that kind of thing the thing all the things i love about comics but i can't do in a novel it's, it's nice to sort of get my head back around that again i mean i've still got the same old problem which is they go all right it's only six pages well in that case how many how many pictures can can we squeeze in can we shoehorn in i would love you know um, and can we have one big splash page or do we have two big splash pages and how do we do this and how do we do that? Because all that structural stuff, I don't really, I don't never think about when I'm writing a novel. I mean, it just, it just almost does itself. I mean, the kind of structure with a crime novel is there. Crime investigation resolution. Boom. Mm. That's it. That's your three-act structure. Um, but it's very different with a comic. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm trying to shoehorn in a few little tiny, just put a teeny tiny drawing here, uh, <laughs> just so I can get another one on the page. Because <laughs> it, it's got to be six pages, God damn it! It can't yeah. be six and a half. Can't be six and a half. It's it, it's it's something that uh, I think it's those limit. I mean, those limitations. I mean, yeah. you know, those limitations. Uh, a lot of people get excited by working with those. Um, as a as a novelist, I find it quite frustrating. It's like mm. a, you know, it's like a film. People say, oh, it's got to have a three-act structure and it's got to be 90 minutes long. What? <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, they, they do say that necessity uh, uh, um, necessity is the mother of invention. So, uh, uh, they do, they yeah, do, they do. Yeah. They do. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, Earthlets. And thank you so much to Ian for spending so much time chatting to us. It was absolutely fascinating to hear his real passion for comic books and also how things like 2000 AD have influenced the way that he works. By the time you listen to this, I will be at New York Comic Con representing 2000 AD. So uh, we may well bring you something back in two weeks' time. Tune in in a fortnight for more from the official podcast of the Galaxy's Greatest Comic Splendid birth rig, Earthlets. Alert! 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 Fell power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com. Subscribe digitally on our apps for Apple, Android, and Windows 10. And download the RM free copies from 2080online.com. Alert! Alert! 
Stand by for urgent updates. Search for 2000 AD on Twitter and Facebook. Watch the latest videos at youtube.com forward slash 2000 AD online. And follow on Instagram at Insta 2000 AD. Program complete. Shutting down.